So what's the plan today? Well, the plan is to is, is to start from scratch. And it's not something very prepared, and that was done in purpose. Um, I wanted to say, well, let's find an API or something that I have enough materials to get started. And then having a fresh canvas is what can we do with it? And how would I start doing stuff? And it's not to be the best code that we we'll ever write. Uh, I, as you can tell, probably I've had a lot of things to prepare and to organize for this conference. So this is more about, you know, let's get started coding for some stuff. Let's take from the basics and then we will see how the 90 minutes will get us. Um, the idea is to go back from you have nothing and then you want to get started writing something. Um, my approach is always to create some modules, but then the, always the question you will need, we will need to explore a little bit. Okay, what's available to us? What can we do with the things? And then where can we find some of the information? So let's uh, dive into it. And that's, I will put that one in the chat because that's a, a, a demo REST API that I found Googling up for about five minutes. And, um, there we go. And that's the thing I found. So let's go and see. I will share what it looks like. And it's just regress and um, test your front end against the real API. And I say, oh, that sounds good. You've got fake data. That's exactly what I want. Real responses, always on. And most importantly for me, at least for this example, it's free. So um, we look at, okay, I said, what, what can they do? And then you look at basic information, but that's exactly what I wanted to have. Like some things to list users, maybe find information about a user, resources. So we'll see what we can do and we'll see what we can grab from it maybe. So I thought, okay, that's interesting, but let's not spend too much time looking at it. Otherwise I will already start doing some tests and finding out about this. So what's the goal today? My goal is to just write some PowerShell that can query this and then get started putting them into some kind of form and um, we'll see how far we go. We're not going to go very far in 90 minutes, but we'll see what we can do. And I've never tried this API except literally just testing that it would work. So if I look at list users and I click on this one, you see, you can find, you can see that you have some JSON data available. So if I take this example and I go back into my VS Code, uh, if I find my VS Code window, there we go. I will open. I will open this, and this is my URL. So if I do invoke REST method, and I'm not going to do that for too long, does it work? Well, I've got something. I've got an object back. So I think well, that's all I need to know. And now let's get started. So, um, what are we going to do now? So the first thing I like to do, and I will take really from scratch is I have a sort of API. I want to go and explore and build something. So I want to build a little module to be able to access this API and then get some information and we'll see how clever we can get. So the first thing I do usually is I will create a repository maybe. So this one you can see I'm on a folder which is called Minicon. But I'm not too fine of this, so I will go into my source directory and I will create my new module folder. So how can I call it? So the so the API is called uh, regress. So I will do let's create it and let's call it my regress. So that's going to be the name of my folder and the name of our module. So I created just that and I will go to uh, my request. Okay, and I will open a new VS Code from there. If, okay. So let me just, I, I just got a, a warning from a gather that says my CPU is overloaded. 
So let me just first of all get rid of this one. And I will uh, close all of the others. That's the polymer and record on the same machine you're doing your demos. All right. I've got this and I've got my I've got my uh, code here. So this is a new folder and this is I will put maybe my source in there. And in my source, I usually do a public folder and I will create a private folder. This is just to say, I'm going to put some public functions and some private functions. Um, and then I want to do a new file. And this is my, oops, my rec res uh, dot, dot p. Let's do the same casing dot psm1. All right. So I'm just starting a module, but I don't really want to use a module file. I will remove that for now. I will want to get things from the private and public repository and I will dot source it. So if I create, oops, get child item, I will list everything from source, the source repository. And I like to do this, not always, but let's do that. Let's join path. And then from my PS script root to the child path. And then we'll just take source. So we take this, you see, I've got copilot enabled. So copilot will suggest things. It's very confusing because my CPU is probably doing a bit too much at the moment, but I do get child items and for each objects done, I don't want to import module. I want to dot source and it's not source, sorry, it's public. We are actually gonna put that into variable, uh, public. It's hard to do and talk at the same time, but we'll do that. So I've got all my, that was good, come on. Uh, filter, there we go. So I will take everything in the public folder, every PS1 in my public folder, and I will put that into the viable public, all right? We'll do the same for private. Okay, and then we'll do very the same thing. Okay, so now we've got, we've got all the variables in those two, uh, all the files that are not there yet, but all the files in there. And um, we will uh, put them into the variables. And now what we need to do, we need to dot source them. So that's actually true. And then we need to do to dot source everything. So we need to dot source what's in public, but also what's in private. And actually, I probably so I have you will see that I have a script layout which might be different from yours. Uh, that's probably because I've been involved in the DC community for too long. Um, so we take everything from public and private and actually I prefer starting with private. So I'm going to do it the other way around. And from there, we want to export all the functions, which is will be the base name and I will explain what I'm doing um, after. So let's give this a try now. I have a PSM one here and I will start adding a private function and a public function. And when I import my module, I want all my functions to be inside my module, but I want to have only the public functions exported. So by doing this, what I'm doing is I, I assume that all my files will be verb dash noun, and then it will be PS1. So what that means is I have a verb, for example, get, 
and the noun for this example will be stuff dot ps1 and then i will create my function in the same way and then sorry oh, actually if i do param it's gonna tell me tag block and those function there we go string and then parameter name let's just do name all right and then we will just return we don't need the return so it's a bad example let's just do getting the stuff and we will do name all right so what's happening in this function is i give a parameter name i will give it a default value because maybe i don't want to set it every time and then my well, let's do mini con there we go so when i execute this function it will return a string which is getting the stuff column a space and then whatever i put into the parameter name or minicon if uh, there's nothing passed as a parameter so pretty simple stuff and you see i went into the g and uh, now i will try this module so what do we do we go import module let's do it import module and then i will go by path and I will try to do the PSM1, which is in source, my reg PSM1. So did it work? Get module my reg res. So there's a module loaded, which is a good thing. And there's one exported command, which is get stuff. So far, so good. It seems to be working. And if I import module, sorry, import module force and i do verb pose it said it removes the get stuff function and it loads the module again which imports the function get stuff so that proves that the little skeleton i've done in my psm1 works so i have public and private so far there's no private function but there's a public one and the public one gets loaded and exported so let's do something wrong so i do a get wrong name.ps1 and if i create the same function but then i do a typo and then we will see if that one is exported so if if i import module force verbos you see that this one doesn't get exported if i fix the name Will it work? And they can see that the second one has been exported. So the get stuff, just before I, when I had the mistake, only get stuff was exported. And as soon as I removed the S, so then it matches the name of the function on the name of the file, then it worked. So if I do it wrong in the other way by changing the file name, and then this one is correct you see that it doesn't get exported. So it, it's by conventions when you do this, it's, I think it's a good practice to um, separate function, one functions per file. It's slightly easier to manage and it's a bit cleaner. And then you can see when you look at your, at your um, folder tree, how they are organized. But then you need to be very careful. If you have a typo, there's something when you import the module, it's not really going to work and it's not going to look pretty. So be careful with what you do. And then always do a little change and then validate that it works. All right, so we've created two functions. We haven't looked at the API yet. We have a module that supports public and private. And I think that's a good start. It does very basic dot sourcing every file. And each file has a function. And then we export only what's in the public. So far, so good. So now I want it to be slightly better module so if you look at uh, when i do get modules you can see i have no version i have nothing so the problem with this is well there's no module manifest that can define some data so let's just new 
module ma manifest and we can do path and we put that into source and um and we'll see what it says okay i'll look at the parameters actually i could do this if i do control space you have the list um of uh, the parameters you can use and then i will do root module in this case and the root module will be my request uh, my rec res.psm1 oh yes the manifest path should be i think my rec res.psm1 no uh, psd1 sorry there we are and you can see it created a little file for me so let's look at that I have module manifest for module request. It's been generated by me today. So you can see it's just been generated. Oh, what happened? Let's go back here. I don't like this comment at the beginning of my file, so I remove it. This looks correct. I have my version G01. It generated a GUI for me. The company is Synergy. All good. All the basic information is there now we can try this again so let's try to re-import this new module but this time by the module manifest oops so import module slash forced and then i won't do with the psm1 but the psd1 this time all right so i've got get stuff that's been imported and not the other one. I guess I haven't fixed my name here. There we go. So let's try this again. There we go. We've got the two files in there. So I have the wrong name here, get wrong name. And let me use it because I haven't tried to use it yet. I just assume it works. Get wrong name and I will do parameter name wrongy wrong all right so i've got wrongy wrong and that seems to be working so far so now i want it to be private so let's put it into private and re-import the module again i always do with a force because if i don't do with force let's see what happens when i don't do with the force it will say, well, it's actually already imported. So we're not going to tell you, and we're not going to re-import it. It's already in memory, so there's no need to re reinstall, uh, reload it. So when we actually do the force, you can see that it's trying to remove it, and then it's trying to re-add it. So what's happening now? We've got method invocation failed because file info doesn't contain method of addition. The problem is, I had a typo there, but all this time it didn't work. This doesn't seem to work. So you can see that this doesn't seem to work on it's good to say PS version table. We're on 7.4.5. And that may change depending on the version you're running on. But basically, it says, well, there's an addition that doesn't exist with the files. So it probably is because it's trying to do a file plus a file doesn't really work. So what if we force it to be an array of files and an array of files here? Uh, and then let's try this again. So now it seems to work. You see, I did a force again, and then it, we force it to be an array, even if there's only one item in each. And then we just say, well, this array of, of private and this array of public, the content over there. And then we just go for every script, we dot source the script full name. So now we don't have the error that we had. 
and we just put everything in there and then you can see it only sees the get stuff but how do we look inside the module if the get wrong name is really um, is already there and it's been dot sourced so we can uh, get the module so i'll do in the volume so my module is there and i can do get module and the name is my reg rest you can see that my module is there okay and you can see now that i have a, a module manifest i have a version okay so now from this version you can say well let's execute the uh, the list command of like the get commands inside the context of this module so if i do get command here it's going to list everything in there if I do get command and then maybe I have a scope. No, I don't have a scope. All right, let's do module, my module. Oh, I'm sorry. My rec res. Copilot's trying to be clever. You see there's one command there. All right. And if I want to execute something inside the module, I can execute like this. And I said my module. And within the curly brackets, what I will put in this script block will be executed inside the module's context. So let's do get command and see if it says something else. Oops, uh, get command module my, I forgot the name, rec res. And now you can see inside the module context, you have the two commands. All right, so now I know that uh, this other function has been imported. It's been dot sourced, but it's only inside the module context. So that's a neat trick to be able to explore maybe the variables that you have within a module or the things inside the module. So now I have, I can be confident that I have a module with a module manifest and I have a function and to get stuff which is public on a function to get the wrong name which is uh, private and it, it's not shown outside of this module all right why do i do this so if we go back to this example here and actually i'm going to go back to just this so if we look at all um all the pages all, all the requests i can do to this api we can see that um, you can list users and what's going to change is the endpoint, which is this, to access it. You will have different endpoints, but it will always start with the same uh, path of the URL. So maybe I can just create a private function for my, um, for my module that goes and get the information on rec res.in and then I will just change uh, maybe this part so this part for each function so let's if I want to go get a single user I can just go request.in API user 2 so let's try this for now so I want to create a real function which does get so uh, request user, I'll do RR for the name of that module, request and request user function get RR user and we'll do by ID and I just do long by habit. I don't know if it's a long or if it's an int, but uh, both should work. And we will do two. Then I just want to say, well, maybe to get user, I just, for now, I'm going to create a new parameter. And it will be a string for now. It could be a URI. And we will say endpoint. And we'll just put this. Now, I don't want the full path. I just want the API path. So for now, maybe I will do this. So, but I don't want to ask my, the, the user of this command to know this. I don't even want them to change it. I just want to be able to change it if I want to test. So 
For now, I'm gonna add this as don't show. So the parameter will be hidden to the user. But if I want to show it maybe later, I can um, I can remove the don't show or maybe I will remove it as a parameter altogether if it doesn't make sense to have it there. All right, so we've got this and now we want to go and get some information. So the way to do it now would be, well, let's get uh, the URI and we add it there. Thank you, Copilot. It's just too fast with Copilot. The problem is I don't like to do it that way. It just makes sense. You're just gonna concatene um, the endpoint with the base URI, but I don't want to have this every time. And I prefer to do it that way. URI equal, and then I will do this. And I will do that with variable interpolation um, on the dash in. format endpoint there. All right, if I do a parameter, I will do like this. So I prefer this way for now. And then actually, I will say base URI is this one and I will do this and I will do that. So I have my base URI and my endpoint. Just for testing purposes right now, I can return my URI and then we will see what happens. So this one should be lowercase because it's just a local variable and that's the way I prefer it, oops. All right, let's give it a go. So how do we do that? We just do the import module all over again. Come on, I can type. There we go. So get RR user. So get, oops, sorry, get RR user. And then he returns the full API. So that seems to be working for now, but I don't like to have it there. So what I should be doing here is invoke rest method, URI, method gets. So what is it going to give me? Get our, our user. Oops, I forgot to import it. So import module. And now if I do get our, our user, I read, I got some data back. So if I want to have just the data part, I could do something like this. Quick and dirty, but I should do the trick. and I get our user. So you can see I received an object, which is my get our user. So if I put into a variable and I do get our user, what do I have? Oops, get type. So I just do a get type on, on the variable return and I just do what's the name and it's the very useful PS custom object. It's good enough for now, may not be later, but I want to do some refactor already. I will always have to um, I will always have to do the same parts where I need to take an endpoint, take the base URI, and for every entries that we've seen in um, every endpoint that we have seen here, let's go back here. I will have to do the same thing, and I will have to add parameters, but then always. Um, always have to go and then build this URI from the base URI and the endpoint. So I want to have another function. And sometimes this is that function that you can, um, you can create also to manage the authentication and retrieve some variables and things like that. So I will create invoke. And in this case, it's RR request. That's too many R. Uh-uh, eh, okay, PS1. So if I create this function, or oh, if I can type, invoke R, R request, copilot is helping me. I never wrote that. Is it correct? Method get, method get. Okay, we'll do this for now. We've got the endpoint here, base URI, that's correct. You see, I already have the files open, so it just generated that for me. And if it's a get, do the invoke request method get. 
If it's not a get, do the method body and then return the data. So I don't think that's very necessary. So I'm just going to take this for now. And then we'll see if we need to change it later. But basically, we've got the method coming here, which can be get by default, but we can specify something else. And then we can invoke the rest method. So if we look at the rest method here, we can see, I just did control space, and we can see it's a web request method. So instead of asking for a string, I will use the enum, which is web request method. And uh, no, it's not that one. I'll do it again. Web request method, that's the one. There we go. And um, I just know because I'm used to this one, but uh, uh, and if I go here, I think it tells me the full net type name. Uh, no, it doesn't, but actually I know it's uh, that one. The other one has, a, has an S, it's not exactly what I wanted. All right, so what does that mean? So this one, Let's see what it is. This one is the type. When you're not sure what it is, just do this. This is a runtime type. Okay, what else does it tell me? That's because I got a type. I have a different value. See, if I do control space here, you can see I have all the types of web requests. So that's an enum. That tells me, well, it can be delete, get, head, merge, and all of those HTTP types, so HTTP methods. So it will automatically um, let me select one of those as a parameter when I use my PowerShell command. And by default, it will use get. What's going to happen is it will try to transform this string into, like to cast this string into this type. So it will basically do this, and it says, well, what's the result? Result of this result dot get type. We have an enum. You see the base type is an enum, and the name of this enum is web request method. So it will automatically transform this string into the enum I want. So it will be casting this. All right, that's convenient. So I've got this sorted. I can do invoke our request. And um, at this time, I won't be able to do it from outside. So maybe I want to put it public. So I will put it there for now. Maybe we'll move back later. And we want this instead of, um, instead of putting this information here, we can just now do invoke our, our our request with the endpoint information and then we will need to find how we put this one so at the moment id is there so we might change that later but let's try what we have now here we go so invoke our, our re i'm missing your now oh it is the endpoint why Okay, we'll, do, we'll put the endpoint for now. So, oh yes, that's not what I wanted. Get our user. So we've put the endpoint here and it just returned this object. Did I import? I can't remember if I import. Yes, I imported first and that works. All right. Now, we can see that we have automatically some information about what is being executed, which is actually coming from the second command here, which is the invoke rest method from there. So the verbose is automatically turned on um, from the sub commands if you want. All right, we've got this information. We've got the endpoint, the base URI, and the method get. So what happened is we said the endpoint is mandatory. The endpoint is mandatory. So if I run invoke our request and I don't specify an endpoint, it will ask it for the endpoint. But that means I can reuse this for any other endpoint that I have here. Let's go and do list user. So if I take this endpoint, let's go, I can't, okay, I'll just do this. It's okay, I'll manage. 
There we go. I'll do the page and then we'll do endpoint. There we are. So I could just run this endpoint and then that still works. So now if I do result equal result get type, I can do this and you can see it's a array of objects. All right, and if I go with the first item of this array, it's a PS custom object. So we've got the basic things. I can go now and then I will remove my get stuff. That was for the testing earlier. I have my invoke RR request and then we can uh, remove this one as well. And I don't want to use invoke RR request anymore outside of my module. My module for my users is only to get users or get other things. So we'll just go and put it into private. I re-import my module force. Oops, not this one. Okay, this is just the alias. It's gonna be quicker when I type it later. So it's my, oops, it needs to be by path because it's in source. And it's uh, my request. And I need to do force, sorry force and I'll do the variables just to see and control what's going on. So now I have one function, get command module my request. And now I can get our, our user and I have my object. All right, basics done. Let's go and see what else we can do with this API. I come back here. So I wonder if there's not something a bit more um, practical and intuitive, a common interface to see all of these endpoints. And uh, there's something which is called Swagger. And that's something you will probably find if there's an API, there's most likely a Swagger for it. And the Swagger will let you know about the resources, for instance, uh, the endpoints, and then the documentation for the endpoints. And then you can also change some parameters so you can go try it out i want page one and i want three per page and i click execute and you can see the curl being executed the url that is being used and then the response body that is being returned so if i create a get all users for instance that should be, I should be able to use uh, the same parameters into my API. So let's go. And then um, we cannot invoke anymore. So we need to do a get our user. So let's, for now, let's create a new one because this one is working. And we will do get our all users. I'm starving, sorry. Function get our all users. Come on, Copilot, you can help me. And then I will just use the same endpoint here. I just need the endpoint. And I will execute this endpoint. For now, it should be the same thing as the RR user. No difference. But this one will give me always this user. This one should give me all the users, which means three of them in page uh, from page one, because they will have many pages. So if I do this now, I import the module force and I do get our, our all users. And then it's not a good practice. I just say it now, but it's not a good practice. But sometimes you need to try things out. So you can see that gives me three users and that's page one. If I change page two, you can see that the ID and the, and the names will change. So I re-import and then get all users. You can see I know I'm on the next page. So four, five, six after one, two, three, right? So we've got, um, we've got those. Obviously we will want to parameterize this. 
So you can see that uh, if you get all users, and if you get RR users here, here you can say, well, you have the ID here, but you're missing some information. So let's change this. And then we could do something like this. And make this mandatory. So now, ID is two, and then we will format the string that we have here, replacing this by the first item next, which is that one. So what will this do? And then we do get our, our user because it's mandatory. This doesn't make sense anymore. I have to supply it. So default value doesn't make sense. So actually I will re-import now and then I do get our, our user and I need to provide an ID and I will provide ID two. And if I do ID one, it's a different user. So if I don't pre provide any ID, it asks me for it. And you can see that works. Okay, so this command works to, pro to display a user, but basically by ID, right? A bit limited. So maybe we will change a little bit how uh, this function behaves. And we will be able to use a parameter set so that we can either get one user by its ID, or we can get all the users, at least in the page, all the users um, available. All right, so, well, let's do that. First of all, let's make a pose. Do you have so far questions and do you have things that I went too fast on um, that you want me to slow down? Uh, if you want, go on the Q&A area and then let me know. I will just make a quick pause because I've been talking for like 45 minutes already. And if you have any question, feel free to come on the Q&A. Is it too fast? Do you want me to go slower on the basics or is it just too basic? So uh, to answer the question, if you press F, everyone at the same time, press F on your keyboard, and then you will send confetti's and I will be able to see the confetti is going. So if you press F, so I want to make sure everyone's there. Press F, keep pressing, so then I see you're there. Okay, good. Okay, now I will ask the question, is it, is it difficult or is it going too fast? Press F if it's going too fast. Okay, it's not too fast. Is it too slow? Press F if it's too slow. Okay, if it's too slow for a couple, for maybe three of you, okay? And then do you want to see, is it two fundamentals or do you want to have like more advanced stuff? More advanced, press F. Okay. If you're, if you're comfortable with APIs and what I do with the APIs, press F. Like APIs is easy, I do that all the time. Okay, quite a few people. All right, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on the API. We're gonna look at classes. Um, I will just maybe change a little bit this, um, with this function, or maybe just a tiny bit. All right, so let me go back here and uh, I will put the chat up so I can see that. I should be able to see the chat now, which I don't know why I didn't do that earlier. All right, so we've got another 45 minutes. So what can we do with this? Um, I have my basic module over there. I want to get this one, but with all users. So if I do another parameter set, maybe. Uh, let me think for a little bit. So we've got parameter inventory. ID, so we can do mandatory, but that will only be for one parameter set. So by ID, all right, so that's by ID, okay. And then we'll do another one. 
which is uh, by uh, all. And all, there's no thing there. Or oh, we're not going to call it all. I'm just trying to find what's the best way. Or we should do. So by ID voluntary. I'm thinking, which is really hard because it's been a very long day. So parameter um, default parameter set name all, and then we'll do that. Don't show and parameter set name by ID, and then all is it that what I want? Actually, I don't want that because that's too complex. Maybe we'll do we'll do one by user as well. Name by name mandatory. All right, and that should be a string. Okay, so we've got by name mandatory. Let's go and look back at the API in there. So that's for users, fetch a user. We can fetch a user by ID, but we can't really fetch him by his name. But that would be useful to be able to find a user. So this API is very basic. So we will have to build the, the search uh, in PowerShell. So we'll do by name and we'll do by ID. By ID, we'll get one by name and then we will make this one by default. By name will be um, not mandatory. And then we can have the two parameter sets there. Every time it's gonna be there, maybe we'll change. Okay, so now we want to have different behaviors. So we can do a switch and then it will be um, by different parameter set name. And the first one, actually, copilot is helpful. It tells me, well, if you want by ID, you will do this. So API user, and then you do by ID. So I don't need to do this anymore. We can do this up. Oh. Endpoint like this, and then it will be users. And first name, ha, huh, that would be too good. So that's not going to work. So we will have to get all the users. We'll do for one page for now. And then, um, sorry, so this one goes here. API, users, and then that should be, uh, yeah, API, users, page, We'll do page one, but we're gonna put, I don't know, maybe 15 by page. And then that will return, that should return um, all the users. So let's do this. And this is assuming there's no filter by name for now. So I'll just do slightly different. We may change that a bit in a second. I just like it tidy. There we go. So let's try this. The endpoint changes basically. And so this one is actually not necess necessary anymore, but I like to leave it just as an option and especially to show the different, the way you can have the parameter sets. All right, let's give it a go and then see what happens. I import this module and then I can do get our, our user. So now I have ID. But if I don't do anything, it should go through the switch. It says the parameter set name should be by name because if there's nothing by default, it will be by name. And then um, it will show me the 15 users of page one. So from ID one to, I guess, ID 14, let's see. Does it work? Oh no, it doesn't work. So why is it not working? So endpoint method get that is that should be okay. Endpoint let's do 
Let's just see what's happening. Get our user verbose. Okay, it doesn't tell me enough when it goes there, what's going on. So I'd like to add some verbose output when I do variables or maybe debug output. So if I do get our user, I have a, okay, someone is looking at my code, which is always useful. Uh, do, 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 do. The endpoint API user page one line. Da, da, da. Feel free if I do mistakes, because it's very hard to do that live and then not looking. Just go on uh, on the Q and A area, and then I will be able to hear you. So you can stop me because I don't look at the I don't look at the chat very often, and that could be useful. So in this case, uh, Robert says I have a slash instead of a. Okay, user yes, like this maybe. I hope that's the one. Oh yeah, that works much better. Thank you, Robert. Okay. So you've got uh, the different elements, so I can go, yes. And then I can go and then get the results here. And then I can see how many do we have. We have 12, so that's probably because the API only returns 12 and I have a paging 15, so I've got all of them, which I'm not gonna do the um, I'm not gonna do the paging thing because that's gonna be me uh, trying this for a while to get it to work. But basically, you could do a for each, and because if you don't do the dot data, you have the, you have the information of how you are in the paging system, so you can go and then keep doing requests until you've reached the end of the paging area. So. Uh, you can manage it that way. But I think there's more interesting thing to do than just this. It's uh, to get those elements from, um, from this API, but then transform them and have them as an object, which is not just a PS custom object, but an object that we're building in classes. All right, so at the moment, we've got this get our user. I just want to make sure that um, my get rr user works with an id if id is four i still retrieve one if id is not set i will retrieve uh, my 12 users so that's working so now i want to be able to do by name so if my name is set so if my name is set i can say well if ps bound parameters Content key name. He listens to my microphone, I'm sure. So we could do this. Um, I will just build a filter because I want to be able to change my filter, maybe. So filter will be this. I can remove this for now. Let's just copy that doing this. Okay, so I do my filter here where object and then uh, first name. I can't remember what's the properties like first underscore name that's correct equal name that's okay i will do a like because i want to be able to use a star and then filter with a star okay so where objects first name like this and i remove the where here i just want the filter and then i can have an invoke web request endpoint and then Filter, oh, sorry, where object filter, and we will name the parameters. And then we can do just for the sake of the example today, filter equal true. Basically, I should not do this. It's not really pretty. Okay, let's change it now. Let's do this. And in that case, we'll do that. And then I can get rid of this. All right, let's do this now. So if so, I have my by ID which returns one, and I have um, my by name which returns all of those. If I specify the name as well, it will apply the filter to make sure the first name equals name. Actually, I will do by first name and last name. So I do or dollar underscore dot last name like name okay and then let's import this module 
and then I do get our uh, user variables, and then I want to say name, and it should be, I don't know, um, can't remember. There's probably a J somewhere. There we go. There's Janet, and there might be an F. There you go. You got. You can see that it went through the last name, and over there again. So we got a few. Okay, so that's working. So I can get, I, I can do filters like this just by having my parameter sets, uh, creating a filter, and then doing on the partial side. Obviously, if you have an API with lots of data, you would prefer to have the backend system doing the filtering for you, maybe with a parameter or something, a research endpoint, and then that's the way to go. But if it doesn't work, if you don't have this, then the last resource would be well, you can probably do that on the PowerShell sites and then do your filtering this way. All right, so, and I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. Yes, Robert saves the show again. Well, last time for me, when I was on stage, it was Jakub. So at least uh, there's always someone to help you when you present, which is good. All right, so now um, we I want classes, and I want to have my user class because those are users. I want to have a user class. So I don't know where to put them because we've got public, private. Okay, I want to have another folder which is classes. Right, makes sense. Now I have classes, and I will want to create an object or class for objects that are users. So I will call it user and then here i will define my powershell class like so and we can have a name but actually we will do string first name actually i will do the same way as we already have string last name and what else do we have um we've got an ID, so I said it's probably long. I should look at the DTO in the Swagger to know what actually those objects are, but uh, that will be fine. Avatar, and I'm missing the email. Come on, do it for me. Now, string, ah, here we go. A bit slow, Copilot, a bit slow. I have many Copilots today. I have Copilot, I have Jakub, and I have Robert. <laughs> All right, so um, do we need a constructor? Maybe not now. So the problem is at the moment, I do nothing with this file, because if you remember my PSM one, it's not doing anything. So if there's an order of things, um, I would say we should import the classes first. So for the classes, well, we could do the same thing. Pew. And then we'll do classes. Classes, sorry. And then we can say, well, just get the classes and then we can do this again. So we'll start with, oopsie. And then you do classes here. So you take the classes and you will dot source them. All right. So let's do import module source my reg force variables. Okay, how can we see if I've got my user? Is my user going to be there? No. But I'm sure my class is working because I just defined basic properties. Okay, I'm not sure. It doesn't work. Let's just go and try to dot source um, my class over there and then see what happens. So now if I do this, does it work? Yes, it does. All right, so if I try to create a new user and I put that into a variable. Okay, I've got something, I've got an ID zero, which is not great, but then I can do set the property. So first name equal test. And I do the last name, which will be Minicon. 
And then if I do this again, okay, so nothing's wrong. Nothing's wrong with my user, nothing's wrong with my class. I just can't get this. So I've got a question which is how to do, how to do a correct sequence of classes if needed. So that's a good question, especially when you have dependencies. There's a magic trick you will see, it's going to be huge. One, two, there you go. This is going to be the first one that's going to be loaded. And then if I keep going one, two, three, then at least it will keep in order. It's a dirty trick, but it's very useful when you have dependencies and you want to do them in, in a certain order. Um, this only works obviously on file systems that are ordered by name. So be a little bit careful. You may need to add if you're on Linux and, and especially on some uh, file systems, you will need to uh, sort them by base name, for instance, or maybe not base name, but uh, yeah, base name would work. So that's one way of doing this if you want to have the classes in, in the sequence. But the problem here is, well, this uh, didn't work when I have my user there defined here because I can't, so if I open a new terminal now, Let's restart this one. That's the problem with classes. So if I try to import this module, in EPMO, all right. And then if I do user, it's not gonna find it. So remember the trick that I have with my module equals, let's do this. And then we can do execute in the context of this module my module, and then we can try to do user here. And then uh, actually we can also just do this. Uh, first name, uh, first name, and then last name, sorry. Let's do this first. Oh, you see that works. So from within my module, I have access to the class, but from outside, I don't. All right, this is kind of weird. So if I do this and then I do uh, my you, my you get type, oops. This is, a, this is user and this is a base type user, right? So if you've seen, there's probably this, the using module magic, and then you can go source, and then it's uh, my rec. That's my module, right? All right, can't find the module. It's probably because it's got a weird. So if I do this, and then I do that, oh, it still doesn't work. Well, the problem is, somewhere so let's try something different okay if i take this class user and i just move it to remove all the variables into my psm1 i just i'm just desperate and i will try to move it there i'll import this module again i'll try the I'll try this. Uh, I'll try this. Why well, it doesn't work? Well, I'm not surprised. So I imported the module. If I try to using the module, ah, oh, no, it found it. Damn it! This is this is getting annoying. So if it's in the PSM one, it finds it. If you dot source a file with a class, it's not going to find it. Okay, this is annoying. So what can we do? Because I don't want to have it there. The goal is not to have this one here. Well, that's not going to work unless we um, try to be clever and then we are generating um, type accelerators for the class. So then when you import the module, it generates the type, ac type accelerators into your session and then it registers them. So then you have access through the type accelerators to the class of the same name. And there's a very good PowerShell doc for that so powershell doc um classes and then i forgot i always every time i forgot which is type accelerator i will find it like this 
that's probably in about about class and then oh is it this one then powershell do, 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 do. let's keep going down i need to remember where it is instance members and then where it is a uh, lot of interesting stuff in there the the um affinity oh exporting classes with tab accelerators there we go that's the one you know what i'm going to take this link because it's a very good doc to look at copy link address and then put it there all right so we can do this and i'm going to do something very dirty which is just copy paste i've done this before i trust it so basically you have the type names that you want to export in my case it's user and then they will create and uh, they will create the type accelerators for those and then they will make it available when i import this module so and i won't need to do the using module so if i restart my shell and then from here Come on, here we go. I do this, and then now I try user. It's already there. So now I can do my new user. Oopsie, I got the equal. There we go. Last name Minicon. Okay, and that's I've got this user available. All right, why did I do why did I do a class user? just so I can create a class from my objects. So instead of having just PS custom object returned from the API, I want to have, you know, objects, actual .NET objects that I want to be able to do stuff with. Uh, maybe later I will have methods or maybe I want to have them as parameters to the commands. Um, we will see that, but at the moment, I just need to transform what I receive from here into um into an object user so if i get our user well actually i'll do by id because i just want one i want one so i do user one user one is this but this is a ps custom object um ps object ps type name nah. Okay, no, I'm, I've got the wrong thing, I think. Here we go. So um, it's a PS custom object. I'll just show you another way to find the types. So it's a PS custom object, but I want it to be my class. So if I try to do well, I want to be a user, and then that's user one. Well, that was too easy, right? So if I do value, Value, get type. There we go. That was easy. So now I can just say, well, for each, for each object um, process, and then we can do something like this. Uh, square bracket. Okay, so we will cast the result one item and then we will cast it as a user. And we can do something similar here, and it's a very dirty way of doing it, but oopsie. And we'll see what that does. Okay, so now let's do and get our, our user. And those ones, we put them into an array user. Array user. We'll see. Okay. And you can see from the colors already that uh, let's take number two. Oopsie. And then get type name. We've got an array of user. All right. So now when I do get our user, 
it will automatically create um, a list of users. And then it will not just be PS custom object, it will be my custom user. So if I want for each user to add new methods, like a two string method, as an example, we can have something like this. Oh, I don't like this. I prefer to have it this way. So we're going to have the ID, the first name, and the last name. And I remove this. And we can do zero, one. Two, zero, one, two, okay. And then uh, I'm missing something. And what does it tell me if I invest it in, uh, within a void method? Yes, because I need to say, I oh, will return a string. That's what a do string is for. All right, so I will make sure I kill my session. Uh, yes. Just so that, and I put this here, just so that um, I, when I re-import a class, it's the new class that's there. Otherwise, it doesn't override a class which is already imported. So if I do import module, and then I do get our user, we've got things like that. And if I do um, you, and then you zero, and we do, to string, what does it do? There we go, we've got the ID, the name, and the last name, the first name and the last name. And that's the two string that we have. All right, so we can have method like this, and then we can do methods to all of them. Oh, actually, yes, that's not gonna work well. So let's go on then. Oh, so something we could do, okay, so get, Summary. Let's do call it get summary. And um, the question sometimes the question is well, I want a calculated property, but then you can't make a calculated property um, like this on a class. So you want to have set property, and then we want to have a property, yeah, we could do it like this, but I want to have something like this. Uh, calculate property, which is this, uh, oops, um, add member. It's not a not property, it's a script property, script method, script property, sorry. And the name of my property and the value could be, uh, could be what to execute. So in this case, it would be, uh, we will do this. And then it will be get summary. And then we'll do just add a summary property. And we will remove this. Just for the example, we don't need to overdo this. Summary. OK. Now we can add the property to um, that will um, that will get the summary here. And I forgot this. There we go. So we've got a script property, and then actually that should be a script block. And then if I import this new, yeah. Okay, so now I can do, I can get my users. Oh. I have something wrong, which is why it's telling me, which is not uh, importing this properly. So let me just fix this. So what's going on there? Are I user F? I'll just, you see in that case, I just look at. Ah, okay, so the question, okay, I'll answer this question because there's a different question in a minute. But for now, I will just uh, try to fix my problem. So it says, oh, get our user is not because I forgot to import it. Did I? Yes, that was as simple as that. Sorry. Okay, so I have my, I've got my users there. 
but that in user zero, do I have the property summary? No. So I need to do dollar u, and then for this user, oops, sorry, for this user, the the first one, I need to add summary property, which is my method, which is just there, and you can see it's void because I declared it void, and then it just add the summary property. So let's execute it, and then see if that worked. So now you can see that I have a script property for this one. Problem is I need to do that every single time. Not very smart. So let's override the default constructor, which is user. And then we've got this. And I want every time to be able to do, well, this add summary property. So now when I will create a user, it will automatically call this. And then that will uh, that should do the trick. And then the property should be available every time. So let's restart this. That's the pain points when you work with class in your shell. And you do import your regex. There we go. My rest. And then, and then I do I get my objects back again. And then if I do zero you can see the summary has been added there. So that means all my objects will have a summary method property because we've added there on the base objects when we created this, which is the constructor of the class. All right, I will do another stop and I will look at the chat and there's a question which is, why not use, why not use this, I guess, which is which is this, or sometimes it's um, this. You can. Oh, sorry. So why not use this? Um, actually, you can. The question is. Um, so I don't know from which part of the code. I guess it's from uh, this one. Why do I do this and why do I not do something like this? And I'm not uh, this, but here we go. So why do I do this and why do I not do this? Um, because there's no particular reasons. Uh, at the moment, well, this one used the pipeline. I, I, I think this one is the most common one. That's the main reason I used it there. Um, I don't mind which one I use. I would probably not do it this way anyway. I would usually change a little bit the way I do my invoke web request and now I'll probably do parameterize because we've got other things to parameterize here. So, and, and the other thing is um, if you want to cast it there, maybe you would just return an array of user and then you will let it do the casting itself. So you would do something like this. or you would do something different depending where you want it. So there's many ways of doing it. And I, I would use that one often. Uh, sometimes people struggle with this version. I think it depends on uh, if you're using PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, if you're using PowerShell 5 and you have only one element on this side, like sometimes it doesn't behave the same way in PowerShell 7 and PowerShell 5. And that's something to sometimes you need to force a little bit like I did here. You need to force something to be an array before you can do an iteration over it. Um, so there's no reason to go one way or another. Uh, I hope that answered that question that was in the chat. Uh, what did I change? Okay, this one. So that would work the same way. And actually, I can probably show you that this way. And then I can do get our user. And that one is from uh, Kontinsky. So that's when there's no name provided. 
and it works the same way as you can see and i can i can omit yes i can omit i can omit the well i cannot really omit there if i do an invoke there so i'm not too sure I'm not too sure uh, what the argument. Get some ring, get some ring. Yeah, I'm. I'm not following uh, the the element bot, so I probably went into another question, or, or I just didn't catch the point. Okay. Anyway, all right. Um, Okay, so this is what we've got. What time is it? Uh, 22, okay, we've got like 10 minutes. Okay, if you have questions, put the question in the chat or just come in the Q&A because there's about 10 minutes left and I should have left more time for questions. Do you have more questions or do you have comments and things you'd like to know? This is, I would say this is the, the basics of um, getting to have a, a little module that just calls an API, get some stuff, and then if you start doing like this, then it's going to be easier to evolve over time. But uh, that's the kind of thing that I think is very, it's a, it's good to have and being able to do that very quickly, that helps you like create a little module. And you see, I haven't published it or anything, but then it took me just 90 minutes to show you how to create something very quickly. So do you have any questions or do you want to know more? And if let's say if there was another session at, at let's say user group or something, what would you like to have after this? What would be the next step? So it, there's a question which is, is it possible to list all classes of the modules? Um, I don't know. I think we, I think yes. But uh, I can't remember how, but I believe in the DSC community. I don't know if Johan is around. No, he's not. Uh, we have something that just looks at the classes. Um, I'm not too sure, to be honest. There must be, but I don't have the answer on the top of my head. To list all the classes of the modules. Uh, yes. So in this case, because I'm using the type accelerators from uh, do, 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 here, so I should be able to go and look at all the ones that I've put, it's there. So at the, at the moment I have just one, but if I had others, they would be listed there and I would be able to get them from the time accelerators. So getting all the classes is not always useful. Oh, well, actually. Okay, so is this session recorded? Yes. So uh, there's many ways, I'm sure I start to remember there's ways to get the classes. Um, I don't have them on the top of my head right now. If you want to base on your code, that I would say the best bet for you is just to look at the classes. If you keep it, if you keep it in the same way where you have a classes folder, then everything underneath will be one class per um, one class per um, um, one class per file. Then you will be able to. Uh, retrieve them and then once you have the name of the class you can get access obviously to the class from within this module even if they're not exported so is there another question yes part for each object yeah used by plan for dot for each use dot net but uh, that doesn't um, yes dot for each is probably a bit faster in some cases but in this case, the, the only problem with dot for h is sometimes I think um, the way it's used, and especially the difference between PowerShell, Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 7, there might be um, there might be an issue. Okay, immutable class as a module, immutable class as a module scope viable. So Crystal, hi Crystal. I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing your session at PSConf U. Um, immutable class as a module scope viable immutable class as a module so immutable class there's not really or do you and uh, the, 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 the PS user may not be the experience with oh. okay sorry i'm just struggling to keep track with the chat so robert yes it's recorded 
and then immutable class as a module scope variable. I'm afraid, Chris, loading and putting the module to all secrets. Okay, so you want to uh, immutable class. I would say you probably don't want to have an immutable class. You just want to have a variable in that module which loads something, which could be a class or it could be an object or something else. And then it's more like, yeah, you have one instance and then you don't touch it. I would say you would just have a variable and then sometimes you would just do, well, here I can have um, script, my module variable equals, and then I will put some data that could be a class, that could be something else. Key, no, let's not call it key, but um, secret one equal very secret, you know me. So if I do this, when it executes the PSM1, this will be done inside the module. So if I go and if I get it there, so I just, um, okay, let me kill this session just to make sure. Okay. So the way I would go about it is import module this, and then I would be able to do uh, my module, there we go. And then if I execute inside my module, and if I do script, sorry, I forgot this. Um, and it's script, I called it, I forgot the name already. Uh, my module variable. So now I have access to this, but it's only accessible through this invocation. User would not really do that. And then um, you could access it. Um, otherwise, you, you would create a get variable, maybe. And then uh, that function, if you have that function, then it, would, it could return this. So basically, I can show you very quickly here. Oop. I don't need any parameter for now. And then here, I can do just, there we go. We could do that. And then I can do get variable. Oh, I'm silly. Because obviously that already exists and that's not something you should be doing. Get rr variable, let's do this. And then I would change the name. I thought it sounded familiar. There we go, let's kill this and do it again. Well, you get the ID. Basically, you do you can access it like this, and it could be a config, and then get our variable, and you have access to the secret. Okay, best practices for using classes in peer in PowerShell. Um, the best practice is to have something that works. Um, the, the, I'm not trying to be funny. The, the only thing is, if it works, it's good. It depends what you're doing. Um, for classes, um, I think it's it's really trying to, under, if you start to understand to say, well, maybe I, I, classes would be useful when I need to do transformation and I want to have the transformation of, of an object within that object. Um, that's where it says, oh, maybe a classes would be better than a function. A function is um, you have something that you get from somewhere and then you know you've got the pipeline and then you do the transformation on those maybe objects um, through the pipeline in another function. Classes is more you have these objects and then you want to transform these objects by calling something and it could be you, it could be an event or something else. Um, so is there... Is the best practices? Um, yes, but they're generic to any language. I would say the first thing, if people are not familiar with uh, object-oriented programming, is just to start. Like if you've been using PowerShell, you've been using objects, try to start with your objects. I would say what's important in PowerShell is to put them into modules and then in a way that other people can use them. 
So that's why I showed you the way to export them in type accelerators as uh, documented by Microsoft. So Crystal put some more details, uh, loading and importing of the module to all secrets. You would get unset variables from private functions. So yes, in this, so we, with this um, in the get, like if I only have the get, basically people will not change it. Obviously, you will be able to change it. So it depends what you really want to protect. But basically, if they change what's loaded in the module, they would be um, they they would be able to change it on the fly. I would say that if you want to store really store secrets. You definitely don't want to do that way. You want to use secrets management module, or you want to have another way to get the modules for use, but not store them anywhere um, in your module unless it's just very transient. So um, let me go for the next function, uh, the next question. So there's some other people maybe having a microphone on. Make sure you're, oh, okay. So if you go. I misclicked, I didn't run away. I just misclicked, sorry. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> stupid to, to run away at the end of your session. No, so. Um, yeah, if you have if you want a blue chair and then you have your audio on, it should not be an issue. So, uh, is there another question? How do you deal with classes that contain as a property from another class from the same module? Because on my side, VS Code is yelling that he don't know the class. Jan, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Let's get this offline. Um, you have a class that contain as a property for another class. Yeah, well, let's take this on offline. Um, objects are born and die. Exactly. All right. If there's no more questions, I think I'm already over time. Um, I did a session with like some, I would say, uh, some basic PowerShell. I would say the fundamentals of creating modules. And I think it was recorded at PSConfiU, so feel free to go and watch this one. I've done this module by hand, just crafting it to show people that this is the, the very basics of creating a module. And it doesn't take long because I see too many people just doing scripts and standalone scripts. I would say just go and try to do modules instead of scripts because then you have tools and you're creating like a tool with different end different entry points. It's a, it's a better way of um, starting your scripting journey. And then you start publishing those tools and then other people can use them. So really, modules are not that difficult. Try not to write just standalone scripts that are a thousand lines. Um, if your functions are simple, but they take more than uh, 200 lines, it's probably a good time to think about splitting them into different functions and then keep your code. Uh, well, well documented and, and especially not too long, so people don't get bored while they go through it. They just see what you need to go, and then they can jump into other files to find, uh, you know, the the function. So if I have a function um, which is called like in this one, the invoke rr request. If I control click, I just go and jump into this other file. So it's easy to navigate. You don't have you could do the same in the single file, but then what's the point if you can do it across multiple files? It's just a preference, but I think it keeps it a bit clearer. And then if you want to move a private function to public, you just drag and drop it to the public folder. All right, that's it for now. 